Yeah. Hello. 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 Yeah. All right. Okay. You are live. Live at Leeds. <laughs> uh, welcome to ODI Fridays from Leeds. I've been told to give an introduction, um, but welcome to the other live streams we've got in Bradford, Bristol, and London. The housekeeping Birmingham. is... Oh, and Birmingham. Birmingham yeah. too. Stage left, Thomas Forth at Heckling. Um, I'm Paul Connell from ODI Leeds. We've got um, our audience here today. The housekeeping is please wait for the end before you ask questions. If you're watching online, um, the hashtag is hashtag ODI Fridays. Please ask questions. We'll be waiting for the end. So, over to Tom. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tom. Um, I'm told if I stay here, I can be seen, so I will stay on the rug of truth. Welcome to ODI Leeds. You can see a picture of ODI Leeds behind you. Uh, if you are sitting in the real audience, then uh, you saw it coming here. But uh, to the internet, that's where we are. In fact, we are right here, right at the top of the building on the third floor. I'm going to talk today about the kind of stuff that we do here, the kind of stuff that we will be doing here, go over a huge number of things, and then I'm going to talk about three things in detail. And the theme for today's talk is about using open data, improving open data, and then creating open data. And there's a large number of links on the slides, and then we will tweet out the links after the talk, and you can follow them and see all of the data and all of the tools that we're talking about. First of all, uh, we couldn't be here, we couldn't produce this stream, we couldn't exist without the uh, very generous sponsors that we have. There are 11 on there. Have a look at them. You'll hear some of the things that they've allowed us to do throughout the talk, and we massively appreciate their support. First of all, I'm going to talk about what we are not going to talk about in today's talk. So we are not going to talk about these beautiful hex maps which show things like the EU referendum result, population density, and number of people with no qualifications in lots of cities across the UK. You can go to the link, but we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about this system that we have here for tracking live bus times and understanding delays as they happen throughout the day. But again, you can go and have a look at that. We are not going to talk about visualizations using open data of Birmingham's tram network. We're just not going to talk about it today. We're also not going to talk about work that we've done looking at car use and where car use is high and where car use is low in different cities and how that's changing over time. And last and least, because we're not going to talk about it, we're not going to talk about these tools powered by open data that let people compare very small geographies for economic performance. So we talk about national economic performance a lot. We have tools here, open tools based on open data that let us look at very small geographies. We're not going to talk about it. What are we going to talk about? Oh, we're not going to talk about parking either. We are going to talk about bins. So um, people who know me know that I like bins uh, and I like buses. Uh, I've already said I'm not going to talk about buses. So guess what? I'm going to talk about bins. The Leeds Bins app is an app that me and Dan and a lot of partners, including people like the Urban Sustainable, Sustainable Development Lab, ODI Leeds, Leeds Data Mill, and then Data Mill North, Leeds City Council, have all worked together on. And the key part of the Leeds Bins app, which a lot of you in the audience might have installed on your phone, is that it is powered by open data. So on Data Mill North, which is uh, the largest local authority open data platform uh, in the UK, there is a data set which is updated automatically every week from the depot that is scheduling bus, uh, scheduling bin uh, pickups. It's updated every week and it tells everyone in Leeds when their bins are going to be collected. We use that open data over here on the left on Data Mill North to create this app, which is Leeds Bins. It's on iOS, it's on Android, it's on Windows as well. And it does a few things. It tells you when your green, brown, and black bins are gonna be collected. It tells you where 
points are for different kinds of recycling and waste disposal. It helps you to make complaints um, and it tells you what kind of things you can and can't recycle. This is the kind of uh, use that we've had of the app. So since we launched in July 2016, and since we started promoting things over Christmas at the end of 2016, we're now up to 8,000 or so unique postcodes that have been looked up using the app. This app only works in Leeds. There are only 22,000 postcodes in Leeds, so 8,000 of 22,000 is huge coverage of the city. And we know that people keep on using the app, not just because they keep the app installed, but because we see the number of unique sessions in the app. So that's the number of times that people have looked up again, come back in the next couple of months and updated their bin days that people are using it. And uh, we think that we'll hit 100,000 uh, unique sessions sometime in the coming week. And this is a kind of uh, app download figures that we've got always quite surprising to me. I would have thought there would be more Android downloads than iOS. The reason that the Windows number is so low is because we only released it about a month ago. So that is already going up quite well. Um, but we've had um, easily 15,000 app downloads. We've still got a, a very large number of them. Well over two thirds are still installed. This is something that we get really good feedback on. We've had uh, dozens of reviews on both app stores, uh, mostly positive, around four stars, which is really good for an app. You only have five stars on an app if no one uses it. Uh, you are, if you do a really bad app, you'll very quickly get uh, one star or two stars. And we have had over 100 separate comments on the feedback form. And so a lot of people are commenting to us as the developer, and I should say that, they comment to us as the developer, not to Leeds City Council. Lead City Council allow this app to exist because they make the data open. But when it doesn't work, people shout at me because we didn't do a good enough job. And that's quite a change in the way that local government and local services work. This is where it starts to get really interesting. I've just shown you some graphs about the use of this app. And if you actually go to the website that I've linked to under the bottom of it, which is imactivate.com forward slash leads binge, you can see all of those live graphs. And those graphs are powered themselves by open data. So we take in the bin timetable as open data. We have this large user base of people using the app. And then we republish after we have anonymized, taken out the postcodes, uh, and, and safely removed any private details of people. We publish data back onto, Leeds, uh, onto Data Mill North. So, if you want to go there now, you can download a CSV file of 3.4 megabytes and s recreate all of the graphs that you've just seen. But you can create much more than that because we've also built open tools using other open data to analyze this stuff. So here's one of the tools. This shows you where in Leeds people are using the app. Now, uh, most of us here will have a pretty good idea what the geography of Leeds like, is like. Uh, people on the live stream probably won't. Uh, these areas here in the middle, Headingley, Hyde Park and Woodhouse are where students live. It has a much lower use of the app. And that's something that we've learned, was known to a lot of people in the council before, that digitally engaging with the student community in the city is actually quite hard. So we talk about digital exclusion a bit. Uh, and what we found is that it, the, the hardest to access digital group in the city is actually students, which is quite an interesting finding. And, and there's the data that proves it. But we can do even more than that. So we have a tool called Open Audience, which is built on open data itself. And it accepts as input a list of output areas, which is what I share from the app. So I just go onto the website, which is at the bottom. I paste in 87,000 output areas for all of our individual uses. And I start getting things back. I understand the demography of our users. And this is something that it gets very interesting. So I looked at the demography of our users up to the end of 2016. And, and I'll just pick out a, a few interesting things that we found. What we found at the end of 2016 was that wealthy older people, these are here, were really over 
overrepresented in the users of the app compared to what we expect in Leeds. So 4% of people in Leeds are of a group that we define as wealthy older people, but 16% of our users of the app were of that. And we found other, other different use cases than we expected. But there was a big uh, push by the council over Christmas to advertise this app more widely and especially to focus on areas where there was low take-up of the app. And so here we are today, five months later in 27, and what you will see on, on here, if you, if you go and have a look, is that all of these pictures are the same size because now we have a really representative sample of users. So in four or five months, we've gone from having quite a biased sample towards uh, wealthier, more tech technically engaged people in the city to now having a really wide spectrum of use in the city. And we can see that using this open tool. We can look at other things. So the red bars in this output from our open tool tells you what our users are like. The blue bars tell us what Leeds is like. So for example here, we see that we get a lot more users of our apps among something called urbanites, which I expect is me. So uh, that's very understandable. We get lower use amongst rural residents. So in, in rural, further outwards of Leeds, we get lower use than we'd expect. We have uh, graphs on the estimated wealth in, in groups of our users. We see slightly higher use among high-income people. But in the last five months, what we've seen is that this low-income users uh, group has really caught up with, with the other groups. We can look at things like age profiles. We have uh, slightly lower use among older people. We have slightly higher use among young adults, um, which isn't surprising. We have slightly higher use amongst uh, slightly higher earning jobs. So now the next thing. What we've shown you in the last bit on the BIN app and open audience is how we have used open data from a lot of sources, from the council about when the bins are going to be collected, but also from National Statistics Office at the ONS, who tell us a lot about general um, properties of, of the whole of the UK, to say, this is who, this, first of all, to build the app, second of all, to say who's using the app, and then third of all, to share back all of the data so that other people who are interested can use that. So the example I've given about where people are using the app, that's been taken up by the Way Services Department in the council to improve the outreach that they do about promoting changes to bin times. And uh, I think this year, one of the interesting changes was that instead of posting out at, at quite considerable expense changes over Christmas to the bin timetable, that's a, a saving that Leeds City Council have, able, have been able to achieve because of the extra reach of digital engagement and obviously these systems with the apps are quite a lot cheaper than posting stuff out so the next thing people in the room can look behind you to there so whilst they are distracted the internet can keep focused they are looking at this thing here that is a windows 10 phone it is counting all of the cars that pass under the bridge. So it's a cheap 30 pound second-hand phone that we wrote software to over two hack events that were held at ODI Leeds, one sponsored by Highways England, hence why we're measuring cars, and the other sponsored by DEFRA, and they were interested in it because cars are the biggest contributor to air pollution in the city. And what we found over those, those two days, lots of different people coming together and talking with us from Highways England, from DEFRA, coming in, telling us what their challenges and problems were, and then lots of people like I hear today trying to work on solving those problems, we found that we don't actually know a great deal about traffic flow in our cities. We know traffic flow on the M62. We know traffic flow on the M6. We know it on the M25. But within the city, what's going past our front door now, we really don't have a great deal of data. So we've been running this uh, on and off for a couple of months now. It breaks every couple of days and we have to restart it. We're improving the reliability of it. And what's most interesting about this is if you go to the website, you can see all the data. We're just publishing it as open data. So you can take the data, use it. 
We took the things down to Birmingham to an event uh, called Trafex at the NEC. We measured people there. We have it at two sites uh, in Leeds doing different things. We can add lots of different uh, locations really easily because it's just a 30 pound phone hardware creates open data on traffic flows. So I am now going to show you some output of the open data that we have created here. So this is a, a graph. Ooh, it's graph time. Uh, I was on uh, the Twitter and I was explaining that I was measuring cars and a lot of people started telling me that uh, traffic in Leeds is lots better when it's a school holiday. And loads of different people had their own theories about why it was a lot better. Was it because people weren't driving kids to school? Was it because parents took a holiday at the same time as their kids were on holiday? Was it because parents were leaving work early because they had to pick kids up from some place that they were? Was it even true, was my question. I said, well, is that even true? I don't know. So this on the right hand side, this is uh, uh, our building. This is where our car counter points out the window. We count cars traffic crossing across the red line. That's what we count. Um, and we measured that on different Thursdays. I think it was Thursdays, might be Fridays, but Thursdays or Fridays. Two weeks apart, one of which was a school day and one of which was a school holiday. We measured that on a school day, 27,000 vehicles pass past the front of this building from right to left uh, on a school day. But on a day where there was no school, 22,000 passed by the building. So yes, the theory that on a school holiday fewer people drive about Leeds is right. But there were two other things that were interesting. First up, on the no school day, what we found was that the, the peak number of, of traffic at the very peak of rush hour was slightly lower. So that's unsurprising, there's fewer people driving. This was the bit that I was uh, a bit surprised by. We saw that on a no school day, people leave work much earlier. So people are leaving work. There's going to be more congestion in Leeds at three and four and five on a day where there's no school than there would be on a day with school. But then shifted two, three hours into the future, people are generally going, at home, going home later, six, half five, six, seven. So this is all open data. You can download it. You can play with it. It's all, it's all there. The last thing, so this is the last thing that we're going to talk about, is housing. I said at the start, uh, bins and buses, housing is probably my third thing that I um, like to talk about too much. This project came out of some work we did right when we were starting off with a, a Leeds social enterprise called Leeds Empties. And by talking with the council, we encouraged Leeds City Council to open up something that no other city in the UK that we know of is doing, which is not just to report the whole city's number of empty homes, but to report the number of empty homes every month in every single ward of the city. So we now take in that data, we produce this kind of map graph thing, um, and it shows that in different wards, the number of empty homes has been going down at different rates. Generally, in Leeds, every ward has seen a, a really big reduction in the number of empty homes. It's, it's been a massive success in the last decade, so, such that we see a number about a decade ago of 10,000 empty homes in Leeds, now is down to about 5,000 and, and still going down. <coughs> So this was a nice output of, of us asking for some data, Leeds City Council saying you can have the data, and then updating it every single month. This has let us do some interesting things. Once we figured out that Leeds City Council would release housing on data, we just kept on asking them for more data. We just said, oh, you've released this housing data, and now I want more data. And uh, this is one of my favorite ones. If you go on Data Mill North and search for private, oh no, if you search for housing land supply in Leeds, that's my favorite uh, data set there on housing. It shows you since about 1980, all of the land that's been used in Leeds for housing, the number of houses, the type of houses that were built on it since 1980. 
but it also shows you into the future where the currently planned houses are going to be, how many there's going to be, what type they're going to be, and so on. Now, if a house hasn't been planned yet, it's not on the spreadsheet for obvious reasons, but there's quite a lot of, of homes already planned for Leeds. Uh, in fact, uh, when I last looked, there were 14,645 homes planned for Leeds. And we can use these hex maps to show exactly where in Leeds the homes are going to be. And uh, a huge number of them, 5,500, are already planned to be right here, right in the city centre of Leeds, and uh, different distributions all around the place. This leads on to another thing. So we started with empty homes. We moved on to... Uh, planning new homes. And what we're doing now as a project with the Future Cities Catapult is we are working on a project that we call a clearer plan. And what we're doing here is we're saying for every part of Leeds, if you type in a postcode, you can zoom into it and you can see things like what retail, what allotments, what forests, what parking there is nearby. You can also see what kind of jobs there are in the area, how fast the broadband will be, what the average income is in that area. You can also see what are the bus routes, where do they take you. You can also have a look at places that are nearby, land that is currently assigned and allocated for planning but has not had planning permission granted to it, areas that social enterprises such as Leeds Community Homes, uh, and I think it's Chapel Town co-housing have also just uh, started a crowdfunder. So we've got, we've got fantastic social enterprises in Leeds who are crowdfunding a lot of money to build community homes. We want to help them build even more. We want to help people understand why other places are, uh, are submitting planning applications. And, and this process, this tool, powered completely by open data, can help with that. So where next because the, we are coming to the end on my uh, slide outline of destiny we are now at the end of the middle so this is the beginning of the end pdfs this is uh, one of our newest most interesting and most controversial projects so it's uh, an exciting one i like controversy so i'm glad to be involved in a controversial project um, i showed you before that we've built a tool that does planning in all kinds of cool ways, that brings in a huge amount of open data, that helps you to create plans in standard formats. But the truth of it is that a plan ends up as this. It ends up as a PDF document. And that is the currency of most local government information flow. It is the currency of most document control. It is the currency of most business control of documents, PDFs. And, and we think that's probably not going to change anytime soon. We'll still need to print out documents and stick them on lampposts. We'll still need to hold archive copies of formal documents. If there is a public inquiry or a court case or a planning panel meeting, they are probably not going to write queries to a linked database. To do that, they are probably going to want to see a document. So we think documents on planning are here to stay. Our good friend across the Pennines, Mr. Jamie White, who you can look up, he's Northern Jamie on Twitter, wrote a couple of months ago what we think is just a fantastic outline of exactly what I've just said. What is the future of white papers? What is the future of government documents that look to change things? And he said in that, in that, in that um, blog post that you could have documents, but they could include more linked data. He even drew a really nice picture about how that would look. And what we're seeing here is that the idea of a document still exists, but we've got links, we've got graphs, we've got live data. And what we realized was that we were coming from a different angle on the same place. So we were using linked data, putting it into a tool to help people create plans. He was looking at plans, thinking, what if we had some linked data that powered those plans? and then people could build tools on it. So we've met in the middle. This is a, a dream that we want. So we, we think this is a, a lovely way of doing it. We think that current PDF documents can all be a little bit more like this within government. So we still have a traditional workflow 
that's based on documents, but we're powering it all with tools that create them. And that's something that you can read about on this blog post. We're working with Adobe on this because they want to improve PDFs. They realize that often PDFs are a bit of a dead end for data, and they would like that not to be the case. So um, that's my final uh, slide, more or less. If you want to come and uh, shout at me in a constructive way about why you think PDFs actually are awful or why you think PDFs are used and how we can solve this problem, then please do. There's a blog post there, or you can find me and shout at me. And that is just about it. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for having the stream on. I think you can ask questions at hashtag ODI Fridays, and then Paul is going to be the question leader. Thank you very much. Yeah, so questions. Tom, don't go away too far. He's just going to get a well-deserved cup of tea. So we've had, uh, we haven't had any questions through on the Twitter Ooh. yet. So please um, get your questions in now. So questions in the room. Do we have any? Yes. Oh, it, wait a second, and I'll come and join you. Paul is walking towards the questioner. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Can you thanks, Tom. Introduce yourself, please. Yes. Uh, hello. My name is Neil McClure, associate from ODI Leads. Oh. Um, I, I, I have a question about your Leads Bins app yes. project. Yes. Um, and following the success of that project, um, what was the response and/or feedback from Leeds City Council and did, uh, did the project change in any way their approach to open data and what they, uh, what they did with open data? That is a good question. Once you've done something, it all looks easy. And um, we started that project probably two and a half years ago. That, st that project started here as one of our very early things. And it all seems simple now, but there was a huge process internally of them figuring out. I think that there was always a will to make the data open. There was, never any, there was never any worry about making that data open. But what there was was a realization that publishing automatically 150 megabytes per week of data on bin collections was quite a difficult task within a, a system that isn't designed to publish open data. So um, there's a, Susan, Girish, and Tom within the Waste Services Department at uh, Leeds City Council have done a, a huge amount of work with the contractor uh, in Barnsley called Bartek to get this automatically published to Data Mill North. That was the hardest bit. The feedback has been really, really positive. And as I say, it's pretty, it's pretty unusual to have um, app reviews where you have about four stars um, and there's very few people that, that hate it. So we had a f we, whenever there's a problem and it breaks the app, we get about five one-star reviews. But generally, we can go and fix the app. So it's quite a new way to get feedback and improve services. And I think it's also quite nice because we're not the council. So the council are used to getting shouted at. They're really good at it. And then because they're paid by the people, they have to be very polite. And I can be quite a lot more blunt with the people. Now, I happen to be quite polite because generally I can fix their problem, but it, it changes the power balance a bit. So what we've had in a lot of the feedback is people with suggestions on how they would improve it. And then we've done, this, we've done the improvement in a week. We never had to get it signed off by the council. We just did it. It improved and they're like, wow, this was great. So that's been the, the main plus for us has been we're just we're free to do whatever we like. Hello, Rachel Unsworth, um, a geographer, interested in also how then service delivery gets changed, whether the contractor, whether the council uses the data to, to show up hot spots or cold spots of, you know, bins that aren't 
collected when they're supposed to be and uh, bins just being tossed aside rather than put back carefully, the things like that, you know. So, and then yeah. how does the workforce react to this data being out there as a sort of, almost, not like a big brother, but it's sort of crowdsourcing the, the quality of the service? Uh, yeah, so at the moment, the app just tells you when your bin's going to be collected. It would be lovely to have the app be the way that you reported that there was a problem. Um, we don't do that yet. And one of the reasons is that we've been quite worried about privacy within the app in developing it. And so in order for a user to make a very, very specific piece of feedback about my bin at this address on this day wasn't collected, requires us to hold and process personal and private information. Um, we can do that. We know how to do that. But the security level that you have to do in order to produce that goes up quite a lot. And the budget at the moment is not what we want. So we, don't want to, we, we just don't want to build that expensive a product early on to do it. But I think there's some real opportunity. The only feedback that, that's been from the data that's been used really is the council can see where people do and don't use the app and target information programs to areas where they know there's less penetration of the information. I think that's the, the only bit that we're doing there. Thanks, Rachel. So we do have some uh, questions via the Twitter. And it's all about bins, mate. People love bins. Everyone loves bins. So how, are there any plans to w work with the university to engage with digitally disconnected students? Right. So the University of Leeds are a sponsor here. And I have shared all of this bin data uh, before it became open data, I shared it in advance with the Leeds Institute for Data Analytics. Now, I think that there will be a bit of a jump from the Leeds Institute for Data Analytics and student information services that have to get the message out about how to engage. I think, though, that that question of student engagement within the city on digital and in all kinds of things is an absolute number one priority for every digital business in this city who wants to hire great graduates and just today it's, it's Leeds Digital Festival this week there's digital job fairs people want to hire those people the, the council wants to engage with every person who's here and the university wants to have all of its students integrate with the city so that they can get good jobs and and do do well from graduating so i think that there is uh, big opportunities for the for the university to get involved i hope that it'll be a lot easier now that there is open data so they don't have to ask for my permission they can use the data it will be updated they can use that however they like so in summary yes yes we want to engage with it and the university are going to do something about it i think they are yeah i think so Okay, next question via the Twitter, and then we'll get back in the room. This is a, this is a great one. Oh. What's your view on the shift from incremental data set release to automated whole organization op openness? I think it's fantastic. And I think it's fantastic for a few reasons. One, Stephen Blackburn, who sat over there from Leeds City Council, doesn't have to go and check all of the data sets and clean them up every time he wants to release something. So it's quite a big task to automate data release, but once it's done, you can kind of forget about it and build services on it. And uh, you, you are really then not adding any extra cost in, in your open data system. Um, I think that as, as far as possible, having organizations that are open by default is the best way to go. And I say as far as possible deliberately because there is a lot of data sets that Leeds City Council and other organisations hold that just shouldn't be shared. So bins, share it. Um, uh, At-risk adults in social care, don't share it. Figure out a way to, you know, you need a, a proper chain of, of assessment. So generally positive, 
sometimes let's not do it. Okay, so we've got the next question. Uh, I'm Claire Linton from the Urban Transport Group. Um, I'm just interested in to what extent things like the Leeds Bins app and the, um, the Empty Homes platform is transferable to other areas. So is it a standard open source code that you know other areas, if they've got their data in the right format, can then take and use? Or is it sort of just designed for Leeds and what's sort of the plan in that dimension? So that is a great question. Currently, there is no standard for how you release bin data. But there kind of is a standard because the source code for the Leeds bin app is open. And if somewhere publishes their, their data on bin apps in a similar format to the one that's published by Leeds, then it's really cheap for me to come and create their version of the bin app. So there's a big incentive there to create a standard, not through a standard making process, but through a use process. And that's something that we talk about a lot at ODI Leeds. And maybe we have some slightly different opinions to other people. And that is that we should maybe be setting standards through use, not standards through a big top-down procedure. So my dream is that the standard for bin days is the one that happened in Leeds because it happened first. And if anywhere else wants to have a, a bin app for their place, uh, it can be extremely cheap to do it because I don't have to rewrite anything. I have to change a word, change a, a logo. Uh, on the housing thing, that is something we already do. So a lot of the data sets that come into all of our work on housing are national. At the moment, we just do leads, but we can expand that really quite easily somewhere. So we use a lot of OpenStreetMap for our mapping. That covers the whole world. If you are using OpenStreetMap, that means any project you build anywhere can, can come in. Uh, if you use uh, English and Welsh statistics, then that's going to cover the whole of England and Wales. So there's, and this is why we like to work in the open and share things, because none of the stuff that I've shown would be possible without other people having opened up their work. So we tend to open up all of our work as well, and then everyone wins. Thanks, thanks Tom. So this is, this is the power of the interweb. So right. we've got a question from Anna Scott, who I know is watching in London. Hello, Anna. What is the business model for updating, maintaining the data layers you showed us at the beginning? So I think this is PDF for planners, or the be better plan. At the beginning? At the beginning. Mm. Let's have a look. We have, over to your left. Let me look. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through them. The hex maps show national statistics that are already published. They're already published, they will continue to be published. If we make better use of them, that means we get more value out of what exists. One. Number two, bus tracker. That data is already published because people already provide live updates to each bus stop. They already provide in-app updates. We already know the value of Google Maps or Apple Maps having transit directions rather than you having to look up a timetable. So that's, there's a business model there. Everyone knows that it works. Um, the, the cars and economic stuff is, is the same. This data is already being collected and published. We're making more use out of it. Um, and if we make money, we can be taxed. And uh, then that's good for everyone, isn't it? So we're paying back through, through that way. The, Parkulator, which I showed, that is OpenStreetMap. The business model is that there is no business model because it works anyway. People donate to OpenStreetMap because they like mapping stuff. And there is also a big business model behind that. I suppose with the Leeds bin app, the, the economic case is, is pretty clear. I've gone through that. You, know, you don't have to post out updates to your bin app if it's connected. The cost of maintaining a digital service is lower. The amount of engagement is lower. Um, the car counter that's there, very little cost to anyone. It's a £30 phone. If you want to run a community um, campaign to put in speed bumps outside a school, guess what? You go and get yourself one of them for 30 quid. It's probably something that you as a community would want to do. If you are a city planning a new transport network and you need to have some intelligence to base your decisions on, again, you go out and instead of paying a consultant, 
loads and loads of money to give you a traffic report with people with clipboards and pens. You stick one of them up and come back two weeks later and you have the data. Um, and in terms of the planning system, I mean, the, the real saving in a business case for the planning system is we have a planning system already that works. A huge amount of the effort within that planning system is about the process of convincing people either that they should or shouldn't plan and to build things. And if we can make that process simpler, it, it reduces the cost of housing. It, it, it helps people to make better decisions and we get cities that we want. So I think that's all of our list business case. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. So I think we're, we're now out of questions. Um, and I'd like to say uh, thanks to Tom, thanks to the ODLE's team, thanks for the audience here, and thanks to everyone for watching. Cheers. <laughs>